Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Felix Mitchell, and I am the current Attorney General of uh, Nabalsa. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out to our session. And we have three outstanding speakers that we will discuss in just a moment. Um, I definitely want to be able to take a moment and recognize um, a member, a former member of our um, organization um, that, you know, um, back in January um, committed suicide. Her name is uh, uh, Chelsea, uh, Chelsea Lee Christ. Um, and the reason why, you know, I want to bring that up is, is that um, we all uh, face some difficult times in our lives. And sometimes we just need to be able to reach out to someone, share, and have someone um, uphold you and lift you up, give you an encouraging word. And I also say this to those of us on the other side of the equation that sometimes an encouraging word can go a long way. You never know what space anyone is in. And I think that if we just approach everyone with love as our first intention and kindness, uh, a lot of our interactions will be uh, much, much more positive. Um, also, uh, I, um, I'm very proud to host this session. Um, I myself has, have had uh, issues with mental health, not only personally, but um, within my family. So I'm very open about it. I think especially being a black male in today's society, that it's very important that you speak on it. It allows others to feel like they are a part and that they're not alone. Um, for a long time in my life, I felt I was alone because what I saw as um, other men and generations before me being strong was actually just not being able to um, be honest with, their self, with themselves. And I can take the positive from what they showed me, but also look at their mistakes and try to improve and build upon them. And I've tried to do that for myself and with my family. So I feel like by disclosing this to this body and this organization, it should give uh, other individuals that may be quiet about what they're going through the opportunity to speak to someone, whether it's confidentially a friend or professional, but I ask that you speak to someone. So thank you. Now let's get on to the professionals. Um, these three ladies, have a wealth of experience. And the great thing about the experience that they bring, it ties directly to what we're doing, being attorneys. And it is a very difficult task, a lot of stress, but we can navigate those things. So first I'm gonna start with Ms. Bella Dilworth. She is a graduate of University of Southern California, Annenberg School of Communications and Journalism. Um, and the University of Southern California Gold School of Law. She's been an active member of the California State Bar, and she's worked as a trial attorney for the past 35 years. Ms. Dilworth represents indigenous clients charged with everything from cockfighting uh, in the city of Compton to capital homicide, theft of giant cargo containers in the port of Los Angeles. Ms. Dilworth is trained and supervised attorneys in the Juvenile Services Division. And she's worked uh, with restorative justice projects for clients with mental health, control substance addictions as well. Um, integral part of Ms. Dilworth's daily legal practice includes litigating police use of force issues, improperly obtained and executed search warrants, false confessions, and overarching issues of law enforcement and credibility. Currently, Ms. Dilworth works with arraignment courts where she interviews and forms and then appears in court with persons who are newly arrested for felonies. Ms. Dilworth has been practicing yoga meditation since 1995, mindfulness student and practitioner since 2015, 
and um, training program and board member of Mindfulness in Law Society. Thank you for joining us. The next, um, uh, the, yes, the next um, person that we have is uh, someone that I think will bring uh, a, a wealth of knowledge to fit and just right when, this is why I, I don't really like to use Apple products all the time because right when I go to touch something, it just goes crazy. So I apologize. Ah, there we go. Um, the next uh, uh, person is Stephanie Lewis. She is, as soon as Apple lets me tell you guys, ah, <laughs> she is um, the government attorney, national board certified NBC HWC health and wellness coach coach. She's certified mindfulness and an ongoing instructor. She helps busy professionals, including members of the legal community, skillful manage stress, increase concentration, and release barriers to performing and achieving personal and professional goals. Um, she's a board of mindfulness and law society and Maryland State Bar Association of Lawyers Assistant Program Committee. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Washington University in St. Louis, a Master of Health Services Administration from University of Michigan, and a JD and LM in tax from Georgetown University Law School. You can find more information about Stephanie at Live Well Flow. It uh, sounds just like it, it, I said it, livewellflow.com. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lewis, for joining us today. And My pleasure. That, and next we have uh, Ms. Candace McKinney. She's an attorney, the principal owner of C. McKinney Law and Associates, which focuses on policy and advocacy, civil rights, and personal injury cases in 2018. She was a candidate for the DeKalb uh, County School Board District 2, where she opened the dialogue of multiple inequities based on race, socioeconomic status, and funding for schools geographically located in the North and South sectors of DeKalb County. In 2020, Attorney McKinley joined DeKalb County School District Office of Legal Affairs and then transitioned to uh, District Office of School Innovation. Attorney McKinney res resigned from uh, the district in 2021 to Lark's uh, second county. Uh, I highly doubt district. it. <laughs> uh, that would probably be the one they let like, no one talk at, because I'm sure everyone would want to talk here. If we could get uh, some control over the mute there. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. Uh, as we were saying, Attorney McKinley is a civil litigator, and her, her prior experiences include practicing areas of civil rights. Um, she mm -hmm. also, yeah, whoever that is, please turn off your mic. Sorry about that. That's what, OK, there we go. Um, Attorney McKinley is a civil litigator and her prior experience includes practicing in areas of civil rights, education, employment, and personal injury. Uh, uh, Teach for America selected attorney uh, McKinley to work in the Atlanta public school system as a first grade teacher in the Bowen Homes housing community. Following uh, TFA, attorney McKinley developed a community-based after-school program with Divine City Neighborhood. After leaving the classroom and earning her law degree, attorney McKinley worked in uh, Washington, D.C. schools in the office of Senator Michael F. Bennett on No Child Left Behind. And uh, she participated in the NCLB and the uh, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Attorney McKinley earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from Spelman, her Juris Doctorate from FAMU uh, College of Law. And she is a proud mother of two scholars of DeKalb County Public Schools attorney McKinley enjoys traveling, is a triathlete, serves as vice chair of the Georgia Bar Wellness Committee, and a certified Pilates instructor. Wow. These, you women are extremely accomplished, and not only academically, not only socially, but everybody had fitness in there too. So that means that your mind, body, and soul are all working as one. So how can I start? And I'll let you ladies jump in. How can we get some of that magic that you ladies are working? Well, we can't see you, Felix. You're oh, I'm, I'm great. Okay. I'm so sorry. 
and and I, was, I can't speak for the rest of the panelists, but that was a mouthful about all of us. We appreciate it. I do. I was just like, oh no, don't say all of it. <laughs> it does sound like I do too much. Um, but part of um, the wellness practice, and I'm not mindful uh, certified, but um, a wellness practitioner comes with time and being intentional. And it has taken me a uh, time to get to a space of knowing that self-care is a revolutionary act. It does not happen overnight. And you just take small baby steps uh, to get on this wellness practice, however you wanna call it, um, so that we can be competent attorneys. Because I know, and I've been there and done that, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about my story you know, later on, that when we do confront trauma, when we do confront uh, burnout and all of that, we have to have tools in our tool belt to refuel and get back up. And um, that doesn't come without sometimes uh, professional therapy. Uh, for me, a sister circle, a family circle, and my faith. Um, and so you get some of that by starting and practicing and not beating yourself up um, if things happen. And right. I just like to say to, to piggyback, of course, on, on what Ms. McKinley said is that when you say get some of that magic, we have to all realize that we have some of that magic already. <laughs> I mean, we're resilient people. <laughs> we made it across, you've come a mighty long way. So in addition uh, to all the tools that we're gonna be talking about today, you have to realize that you already have some of that. And if you're in the ball stuff, you have some of it. <laughs> yeah, and just to add to those both excellent comments is um, trusting yourself. Right, knowing that you, as Bella said, you, you already have some of that magic in there and you can do it. You can get it done and uh, setting boundaries. I, I know some of you have probably heard me talk about this before is you know knowing what to focus on and knowing what to let go of um, so that you can accomplish what it is you want to accomplish without burning yourself out. Yeah, you, you, you talk about boundaries and I think it's, it's important, especially as law students, because I find myself um, trying to do more than sometimes I'm really capable of doing or trying to be Superman, as I'm told in my own household. Um, so let's start just with the basic questions that, um, uh, that we've, we've gotten. Uh, let's start with what is mindfulness and um, I guess we'll start with Ms. Uh, Dilworth on that question, and then we'll work our way around the room. You know, uh, there are a lot of definitions of mindfulness, and depending on where you train or who you're talking to, you'll get different ones. And I just so happened to be looking at a book where I trained at UCLA and the mindfulness uh, the Mindfulness Awareness Research Center called Fully Present, but they don't really define it except to say, which might be helpful for us because we want something that we can apply, but that mindfulness is like a seatbelt for your mind. You know that you're going to go through trauma. You know that you're going to go through unexpected things, but when you have mindfulness techniques and there's uh, several of them, some we already know that we don't necessarily call mindfulness that you the whole thing is to to with awareness and no self-judgment being able to put a space between an incident and your reaction to an incident so it is like a seatbelt. so when you crash against the tree you don't get ejected if you have tools if you have your seatbelt on and you have tools in your tool belt. Uh, so that's kind of a broad definition. There, there's some more other ones, but I like to think of it that way as a seat belt. Great, great. Uh, Attorney Lewis, your, your thoughts on, on mine, please. Uh, Bella covered it pretty well. The, the definition that I usually use is one um, by a gentleman named John Cabot Zinn, who's credited with taking the concept from the 
the Buddhist culture and bringing it to the West and, and secularizing it, um, particularly in the healthcare system. And he defines it as um, an intentional awareness. You know, it's, it's an awareness on purpose um, and non-judgmentally. And I think that was totally encapsulated in, in what Bella said. And so it, it can show up in many different ways. So most people think of mindfulness, they think of a sitting meditation. But as Bella indicated, it's not just a sitting meditation, it's also about how we live our life. So it's how we react to circumstances, it's how we engage with others. It is, it could be, I spent a lot of time um, with mindful eating you know, being aware of our eating habits. So there's no part of your life in which you can't employ mindfulness. And I actually came to mindfulness through movement. And if we have time, I plan to do some movement, um, some Qigong movement. So there are different ways of entering a mindfulness practice as well. And each of those segments of a practice inform and support one another. Thank you for that. I, I, I love the ideal of Zen. Sometimes I just take a moment and just take that five minute moment for myself. Even if I'm running a little late, I just feel like I need that five minutes for myself. And so I'm sure attorney McKinley, uh, practicing attorney, running a firm, how does mindfulness work for you on a daily basis? Uh, mine is similar to Attorney Lewis because um, mine shows up in my Pilates practice more so than not um, because you have to be present. Your mind and your body have to connect in order to um, do the movements because it's all about control with your breath. Um, so I'm not a mindful practitioner uh, in, so, in, in so much, but I'm an I'm a act, uh, a active participant uh, in my in my movement because I have to move in order to practice law. Um, I can't really get into like writing a brief and doing all those things we have to do unless I show up in my physical practice, engaging my breath and um, making sure my mind is ready to do the work. And I just found Pilates to um, help me get there. And then I have to be present. I just have to be there. I can't have TV on and all these other things on. I have to take that hour for me. And even if I'm teaching, um, I always say, just try to clear your mind with my group classes or even just a single class with my students and say, you have to just take this moment for yourself. Try not to bring all that to the practice so that we can be present and mindful because uh, you don't want to hurt yourself either. So that's how it shows up for me. Progress. That's, that's very, very true. Um, Attorney Dilworth, how can law students and lawyers incorporate the techniques of mindfulness into their lives on a daily basis, on a regular schedule? I use my Apple Watch. They have a great like app that reminds me about those five minute breaks. And I have it set where it comes up like every hour and a half, two hours. So beyond that, what do you suggest? Well, that's the whole point is that we're all very busy and all of us have different backgrounds. I think us in our modern age, we're lucky. We have lots of apps that can remind you. <laughs> we have lots of timers. I have an Apple Watch too. I have Insight Meditation. I have Calm. But to tell the truth, um, you know- That's whack as fuck. <laughs> We, we have to make time for ourselves. And the problem, I have the kind of practice of law that was different every day. Uh, you know, even to this day, especially I'm a criminal practitioner, we, I talk to people who come straight off the street, people who are in jail, people who are still high, and there's always different circumstances. So how we take time every day. And I also come from the background where I meditated uh, since 1995. 
but everybody is not a sitting meditation person. Uh, maybe, you know, you pray, maybe you uh, do Pilates. I, I, I do Pilates too. And the reason I do Pilates is because I have to think about it. When I used to get off of work, I couldn't think about anything else except for not falling off the reformer. But what I suggest about uh, how you incorporate it in every day is to take some time. You have to take some time so that when you're confronted, like in my case, who with a client um, who's angry, who's scared, or who may want to smear feces on you, or somebody's parents who are angry and scared because their little Johnny who would never do anything wrong is locked up and will be locked up. So when you take some time for yourself initially, then when you meet these challenges, they can come into you. So it is consistency and it is every day. And you know, we've just been told three different ways of getting the mindfulness, but it's just like the, um, they have a thing in mindfulness training, which is kind of a, a, uh, a stereotype. They say, you can't help anybody else. And that's what we do as lawyers, no matter what kind of lawyer you are, unless you put your mask on first. If you're in an airplane and you're going down, they tell you to put your mask on first. So that's the main thing is that, and you said the word, the answer was uh, in the question, you do something every day, but what you do is up to you. Great, great. Uh, Attorney Lewis, um, let's, let's go uh, a different direction. Um, you spoke about exercises, and I want to make sure that the, the attendees come away with something that, you know, with us, we like to hold things tangible that we can mm -hmm. come away with. And so I want to take this moment to allow you to uh, uh, provide a demonstration um, so that we don't run into a situation where we run out of time. So the floor is yours. Okay, wow. All right. So um, what I'd like to do, and, and Bella, you might want to chime in if we have time, uh, if it's okay with Felix with a, with a breath practice. I like to start with some movement. And some of you I've, have, have participated in this before. Often when we think about mindfulness and movement practice, we think about yoga. I'm not a yogi. I do yoga every once in a while, but I'm a, I do Qigong, which is an ancient Chinese practice of gentle, mindful movement. Um, this practice is, um, there are like 7,000 different forms. So I'm giving you a little bit of a taste. Um, if these forms don't resonate with you, there are going to be some others that might. Tai Chi is a form of Qigong. Um, and and you probably, you're probably somewhat familiar with Tai Chi. And I started here with movement because I was, my mind, I mean, I was just way too high strung, right? <laughs> to just sit and, and watch my breath. Or so I thought, because I learned later that it's perfectly normal for the mind to run and be busy. And that's part of the practice and over time, it learns to calm and settle down. So let's start with a little bit of movement and then we'll go into a sitting meditation. I see Jeffrey saying yoga advocate. Yoga is great, it's just not me, that's all. <laughs> yoga Nidra is wonderful, uh, restorative yoga, yin yoga. But I'm gonna introduce you to a little bit of Qigong. I'll try to mix it up a little so that they are not going to speak with you. Um, and so you can join with me if you like, you can do this uh, sitting or standing. Um, it's completely up to you. Just don't do anything that doesn't work well with your body, okay? If you have any injuries or anything like that, then refrain from doing the movement. We always start with an upright aligned posture called the Wuji posture. Our weight is distributed evenly on our feet. Our hands are a little bit away from the body. Tailbone is sunk. Your nose is in line with your navel. And there's an elongation of the spine. So you imagine a string pulling you up the top of your head. 
connecting, connecting that channel from heaven to the crown of your head and your feet resting on the ground, connecting to mother earth. And just checking in, connecting with the body, because that's what we're doing in mindfulness. We're connecting with what's going on, not just outside of us, but even more importantly, what's going on inside of us. Checking in, where are you? Are you here in this moment, in this space, this time, or is your mind focused on the past or the future? And the breath, the breath is so important. Noticing the rhythm and the flow of the breath. And we're gonna pull a couple of movements from a, um, a form called Eight Brocades. It's, it's got eight movements in it. We'll do just a couple of them just so you can get a taste. It's one of the oldest and most popular forms because it's easy and it has wonderful benefits, but also it's, it's easy to learn as well. So we're gonna take our arms over our head and we're gonna interlace our fingers and working in a little balance here too. So. The palms are um, touching the top of the head. You're going to raise your arms and your heels if that's comfortable for you, and then come down. And then you're going to alternate. So the pal palms are facing the sky and do the same thing. And just do, let's just do two more rounds of that. We're stretching, working in balance, just regulating the entire system of the body. And these movements, and then coming down. And usually we, I'm not gonna really harp on it um, for, this, for, for this session, but in most in many of these movements, there's coordination with the breath. All right, so the next movement, one hand is gonna go over the head, the palm facing the sky, the other by the, the center part of the torso. And you're gonna stretch so that the upper arm is moving up and the lower down to the floor. And then you're going to reverse. Now, making sure that there's still a bend in the joints. So when you stretch the arms out, there's still a little bend in that elbow. Our knees are always soft in Qigong, right? There's always a little bit of a, of a bend in the knees. So we're not locking joints. So a principle, a key principle of Qigong is that we don't use any more energy than is necessary. We reserve our energy. And then just let both arms come down to the side. All right. Now we're gonna do a movement called uh, punching with angry gaze, except we're not gonna have an angry gaze. We're gonna have an intentful gaze. We have enough anger in our culture already. We can let the anger go and just be intent. So you're, you've got a light fist. You're, you're, the fingers are facing up. All right, and then we're gonna punch out. There's gonna be a rotation, right? And just do that a couple of times each side. And then we're gonna punch diagonally. So there's a rotation of the, of the wrist as you punch out. Now come back to center. And then you're gonna be facing straight, but we're gonna punch to the side on a diagonal. Again, soft knees, intentful gaze. If you like, okay, come back to the center. You can go into horse stance, widening the stance, bending deeper, if that's comfortable for you. And then let's do that again. Let's just. You're doing it not too fast, not too slow. And now diagonal. Come back to center. Okay, so those are just three out of a series of eight. Now we're gonna do something called playing with energy. All right, so your feet are shoulder width apart, hands by the side, and as you, you're gonna lean, you're gonna shift your weight to the right foot, okay? And as you do that, you're gonna raise your hand to a, you know, about chest level. And then you're gonna do the opposite. You're just gonna shift. Just get into the flow of it. Let your mind focus on feeling in the body, nice, smooth, 
rhythmic movement. So what we're doing with these slow rhythmic movements is we are activating the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the rest and digest response. We're calming our nerves. One more. This one, I, I call it, I call it peekaboo. So your hands are in front of you, your palms are faced that way. And as you shift your hands in one direction, your body is going to be shifting in another. And it's like you're looking behind the screen or, or a door. You know, it's like a, a kid on Christmas who's just peeking in, seeing what the parents are putting out, uh, what the gifts are. And we're just playing with energy. Felix, do you want one more or do you want to go to the meditation? Let's move to the meditation. All right. So those are um, a few out of a gazillion <laughs> different Qigong movements. But again, the idea is to connect with yourself, connect with your body, and calm that nervous system. There are other elements to it. You know, it can become a very spiritual practice, so on and so forth. But that's not what we're here today. So for our meditation, finding your comfortable meditation posture, your body aligned, but at ease. Closing your eyes or gazing them downward if you prefer. Just focusing within. Focusing on your breath. And not trying to control it, just watching the sensations of the breathing, the natural flow of this God given gift, the breath. Noticing that the breath knows just what to do. This is one part of the day where you don't have to decide anything, direct anything, do anything. Just allow the body to be breathed. And we notice the mind wandering. And that is perfectly natural. The mind wanders, it does that. Just notice and gently and kindly return your attention to the breath. When you notice the wandering mind, and kindly return your attention to the breath, you are practicing mindfulness, that present moment awareness. Not resisting, simply noticing and moving with the natural flow. Expanding your awareness around to your surroundings. Feeling the connection of this group. Feeling sense of centeredness in the moment. And when you're ready, 
gently and kindly. Open your eyes. Okay. So that's Thank a little, you. you're welcome. You're welcome. That should have slowed everything down from the earlier session of going over amendments, anybody <laughs> rushing to the convention, running late today, that brought it all back to a nice, normal resonation. So that's awesome. I guess one of the questions that we really, really had and, and was discussed, and this is for attorney McKinley, um, how can, what is the problem? Uh, uh, the, why is there a strained relationship between mental health and, and, and the law? It, it seems like techniques like this and, and, and people you know, do everything they can to decompose uh, and, and relax. For some reason, I, I've tried to play golf and that turns out it's not as relaxing as I thought it was gonna be. Um, but with that being said, why is that a, this strained relationship between mental health and attorneys and the law in general? Well, Felix, if, if I had the answer, I would definitely, you know, probably not be on this call. I'd probably be selling the number one book. Um, but I'm, I'm in Georgia and um, I am vice chair of the wellness uh, committee. And we struggle with trying to pinpoint this disconnect um, and this strain because we've had an uptick in suicides and alcoholism in Georgia. And I think the ABA um, is seeing that across the nation. Their last report, and I'll, if I got it, I'll drop it or I'll send it later, was in 2017 um, about the um, uptick in suicides across the nation as well. Uh, with that said, um, our bar is looking into these questions and trying to pinpoint um, uh, from the professionalism side, the discipline side, um, and kind of backdoor it to see if the mental illness is starting here and we're embarrassed or um, don't have enough coping mechanisms. And then, you know, you get reported to the discipline side. So that's why the wellness committee in my state has been um, so active, trying to uh, normalize what wellness means in the practice. And we basically are on an awareness campaign. We have a lawyer's assistance program we have another program called Use Your Six, um, meaning you can pay your dues uh, to the Georgia Bar and get six sessions with a therapist. Um, no cost is included in your bar dues. We also have a peer-to-peer -peer program where um, if you are struggling, uh, especially during COVID um, in, in other people's practices, people had to take time other attorneys could take over their practice during that time. And I will share with you all, I'm a two-time survivor of COVID. Um, it was not anything I would wish on anybody. So not only um, is mental health, uh, physical health, when we're in unprecedented times and trying to figure out how to emotionally recover and phys physically recover, um, and then economically recover, especially if you're on your own practice like me. Um, I know I've said a lot, I'll drop a link in the chat to um, the Georgia Bars Living Well website. Um, but the strain can be um, taken down some by doing what we're doing here. Um, and I've talked to two of the law schools in my state, um, Emory and um, uh, GSU is next week, um, just so that we can say, look, y'all, we are here, you know, pass the bar, of course. The practice is going to uh, take you up, but you got to start now in, under, in, in law school because there are so many things thrown at you and not to get on the culture of law school, you know, sometimes just a lot of alcohol around and other things. But if you set your boundaries now, you figure out where, where you can go without having to use unhealthy coping mechanisms. And I'm speaking to myself too, because I went through it. Then when you enter into the practice, you may hit a wall, you have some healthy coping mechanisms to, um, to fall back on 
and, and not have to get so much in that strength and know that there's people like us to help you. The bar is there to help you in each state, especially if you want to take the Georgia bar, we're here <laughs> in my state. Definitely. And I posted in the chat the American Bar Association links to the directory for LAPs. I know at Northern Illinois, um, the State Bar Association comes um, every year and gives a seminar about LAPs. Um, and, and, and those help out law students as well as lawyers. Most state bar associations provide that service. So, uh, Attorney Dilworth, um, what, with the current, I guess, uh, coming off of COVID and the competition of, of law school and the competition of being a young attorney, um, what are some helpful uh, tips that you can give the Nabalsa uh, uh, Assembly here um, to, to help guide them through these early pressures? I know we talk about mindfulness, but maybe um, you could provide some guidance from your experience when you were going through the process, especially being so accomplished. And uh, that obviously takes the skill navigating all those things and, and keeping in balance with your mindfulness. So do you have any advice to the students? Well, you know, <laughs> way back in the last century, <laughs> when I was going through it, we didn't actually have anything. I have a niece um, who's a lawyer, and it, it, the, the great thing about it is that as time goes on, we all have more tools. So I remember talking to her and saying, well, Ned, you better do this, this, or that. She says, I got this. And she started off with physical movement because a lot of times, uh, like I said, I do happen to sit, but that time between law school and the bar, you're thinking like, man, I can't wait to get out of law school. Then it's gonna, you know, I just get through this bar and then things are gonna slow down, but they don't. <laughs> it's just that you <laughs> wrap yourself up to this level of achievement and you're right, in order to survive, uh, you have to, it is really a mind-body connection because sometimes you can't even sit still if you're nervous. And, uh, you know, the, the coping mechanism I had, you know, and unfortunately still have, you know, I maybe don't smoke or drink, but I certainly do eat. <laughs> I eat a lot. But my suggestion to you is to not go through it alone if you're studying alone. Uh, and now, you know, with everything being online, you may be, you know, don't necessarily, don't cut yourself off or isolate yourself from your friends or your family to the extent that you need to. If you have a faith that you practice, make sure you make some time for it. And it's like you said, Felix, it doesn't have to be a whole hour in mass or a whole two hours here or Oh, that you know, just take yourself five minutes or 15 minutes outside of your studying because we do have a tendency to say we're just going to put one foot in front of the other and get through this, but mm -hmm. it doesn't change. And the habits that you have now um, in, in transitioning from law school to bar uh, to the lawyers, and a lot of you have jobs that you're ready to step into. If you don't um, make good habits now, then you will uh, at, at one point just crash. So that's the main thing I would say, uh, as we've been saying, do something every day, hopefully have it integrate with your breath or movement, have the, the body and reach out to people, but do not isolate yourself from those who love you or those who were in school for you or, or even from those who hate you because they'll keep you on your toes too. <laughs> so that, that's, that's my, base, my advice, no isolation. Yeah, yeah, sometimes uh, haters can be your biggest motivator. And I, I remember that from sports and, and, and just, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm fortunate the law school I go too, I think we all went through at the same time. It's not as uh, much hateration as I expected. So I'm going to say it at, at that. Um, 
that may be unique for me anyway. Um, as we make our last rounds, uh, and thank you so much for that and your time, um, Attorney Dilworth, we really appreciate it. Uh, uh, Attorney Lewis, I appreciate the mini workout. Uh, not sure if my feet appreciate it, but thank you so much. Um, any last thoughts or, or, or advice for our, our uh, law students, folks preparing for the bar, just trying to pull their grades up, just trying to survive this semester? Um, just breathe and do what works for you. Don't necessarily listen to uh, what, what works for someone else to help them get through it, find what works best for you and take it step by step. I think I, I can't beat Bella and Candace's uh, uh, answers before they, <laughs> they, they, covered, they covered it all. But, you know, don't, don't push it, right? Just, um, you know, you can start small with something like one of the practices. And of course, understand that mindfulness isn't therapy. So, you know, therapy and lawyers assistance programs and the type of programs that Kansas, Candace was talking about are all very important. But if you're talking about integrating something like a mindfulness practice, don't be aggressive about it. You know, integrate it and ease, it, ease into it um, because you can, you know, you can all, you know, and it's also backfire if you try to be too um, uh, intense about whatever type of practice you want to bring into your life. Thank you. Thank you for that, those kind words. And we appreciate your time, Attorney Lewis. And, and again, thank you for the, the mini work, uh, workout. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, Attorney McKinley, you, you're going to wrap us, uh, wrap us up. Uh, and I kind of feel bad, but I, I, I want to make sure I ask Kayla's question because she's, uh, she's, she's asked. And so we can do this in, in, I guess, in the wrap up, because I know you can, you can do this. Um, the diet, uh, she's talked about her diet and how it's, uh, how should she change it as she's entering the, the legal system. And, 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 and that's what she wants to, to find out. So if we could get that to her in like, two minutes that would be sure awesome. sure yeah I, that I was I was looking at the chat too and um, I was going to address that because it's all about a physical and healthy relationships because the second part was about social um, relationships and we've been isolated like attorney Delworth has been saying and it goes back to where I started about intentionality um, you have to intend to be well to yourself um, and you have to put yourself first and not think that that's selfish. And I thought that a lot, I think as women, um, and I'm speaking to everybody in the community, but women first here is that we tend to do for everybody else before we take care of ourselves. And then we sometimes, and I know I did, blame myself for um, taking time for me when I'm you know, trying to raise children and, and go to law school and do all these things. Uh, but you can't do all those things if you're operating from um, a glass that's not even full, not even halfway full. So you have to nurture yourself first. That means putting good things in your body. I am not a dietitian. I'm on a diet called everything in moderation. So if you uh, like ice cream every now and again, put that and tend to put that into your uh, Friday fun time with the family or whatnot. Um, but I do subscribe to a diet now. Now I've been in the practice for 13 years, not um, as seasoned as my other colleagues. Uh, and I experienced burnout early in my career and it was due to an unhealthy diet. I was trained for a triathlon and I wasn't getting enough protein. I landed myself in the hospital. Um, and it was, it was, yeah, I was almost on my deathbed because I had let my diet go so far, trying to keep my mind and keep going. I had pushed it to the limits. My body just gave up. Um, so everybody's different in terms of their diet. I don't want to say, oh, eat this or don't eat that. But listen to your doctor, do what's best for you. My diet is eat everything in moderation, listen to my body and take care of it. And then that'll nurture me so I can be well in every space that I am in. So if I'm in my law school friend circle, my Spelman sister friend circle, my colleagues, I show up and I'm present because I'm taking care of myself. 
and everybody knows, and this is the last thing I'll leave you, I believe in wellness uh, uh, wholeheartedly, whatever that means to you. And I'm normalizing wherever I go wellness in this profession. And I take Wellness Wednesdays. It could be a half day, it could be a part day, it could be a whole day to do whatever Candace feels like doing. Uh, it could be a dinner, it could be a massage, it could be anything, but don't call me on Wellness Wednesday. I probably won't pick up because that's my day. It doesn't have to be a day. I'm just saying that is what I've been incorporated during COVID uh, wellness Wednesdays. Try it. Well, it's good. Thank you so much for that. Ladies, thank you for uh, joining us for the mindfulness uh, session and be sure to everyone to check out livewellflow.org um, for more information and check out our, our, our speakers on our um, WOVA app. Thank you. And have a good night. Up next is the um, is the Allen. Uh, make sure you stay tuned. We have the Obama Foundation and a whole bunch of guests. So that's the next seminar, folks. Thank you. Thanks, Felix. You. you did an outstanding job. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye bye.